from. Okay. Uh, um, okay, let me just uh, just share my screen with you. Uh, mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm trying to share. Um, okay, let me see. I want to share the notes on my iPad. Okay, here we go. All right, I use the MCA logo. I hope you don't mind. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. May, Thanks to the may, 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 Maybe let's, oh. sorry, sorry, Asita. Maybe let's wait 30 seconds so people can catch their breath. And then we can continue. Oh, not a problem. Not uh, I know problem. we are we are already a couple of minutes late, uh, but this is in Argentina, so being late is uh, we, we, should, we should be a bit late. Hopefully, not not very late. Uh, okay. Should I put my <laughs> should I my clock for twenty five minutes or thirty minutes? <laughs> so so you have thirty minutes from the time you uh, you start. All right. Then fantastic. Then I'm gonna put my time track tracker for thirty minutes. So whenever yeah, I, you prefer, I, I'm ready to start. Okay, so I think with the discussion, we already had 30 minutes to catch our breath. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Azita Mayeli from City University of New York. And she will tell us about, well, as you can see, completeness, exponentially completeness, and approximate orthogonality on the ball. So please go ahead. Thanks, Thanks Pablo. Thanks, Pablo Teuxola, Gabriel, Radu, and the other organizer for the invitation. That's a pleasure to be here. Excited to see you. Yes, uh, as Pablo mentioned, I'm talking about the approximate orthogonality of, of, uh, on the unit ball. So the motivation and uh, the motivation of the, car, uh, the work basically comes from the, the fact that the unit ball doesn't admit any uh, exponential, uh, orthogonal exponential basis for dimension for the ball of, in the dimension two and higher so i'm going to start with the motivation and some historical background and then uh in order to prove the result we need some preliminaries and definitions that i'm going to show i mean mention and then uh the results of this, uh, the the work and presentation is about exist non-existence of the approximately orthogonal exponential frames on the unit ball in other words we are not just having a, we are not just saying that the uh, the unit ball for L2 of the unit ball doesn't have an exponential basis which are orthogonal, but even they don't admit any frame of any appropriate orthogonality, which is a strong result. So the motivation comes from uh, some work, for example, in dimension two. Uh, the work by the Poglet in 1974, he proves that he shows the proof that the disk does not have any orthogonal basis. When I say that this does not have any orthogonal basis of exponential, since uh, this is the, this notion might not be uh, clear to everyone. So let me just mention that if B is the sorry, if B is the ball, I mean that the L2 of the B does not have any. Uh, base orthogonal basis in the form of the exponential. So in dimension two, um, Yosovich, Katz, and Tower proved in 2001 that the only convex body with the, the convex body with the point of curvature do not have orthogonal Fourier basis, which is basically stronger than the statement, the previous statement. And then in 1999 and the 2001, there was improvement that uh, the in the dimension two and higher, not only this, but in the higher dimensional case also the ball doesn't have any orthogonal basis of exponential. So in uh, which uh, previously, I mean, uh, originally proved in 99 by Yosevich as Peterson, but the stronger result followed by Foucault that I say that if it exists any set of orthogonal exponential functions, then they, the set must be finite. That basically kills or proves that the, uh, the idea of not having a exponential basis. Which are orthogonal. So it's been conjectured since we have a finiteness here, it has been conjectured that the number of the set is bounded by d plus one. The conjecture is still open. And um, then later, uh, we were also uh, using by motivated by this fact, we uh, proved that in 2018 and in a joint work with Yosovich, we showed that 
If we take the characteristic function of the ball, it doesn't serve as the generator of the couple of orthogonal phases for L12 RD. So it's not just the ball doesn't uh, have any orthogonal phases, but also if you take the characteristic function of the ball and translate it by discrete values and modulate it by uh, discrete values, a uh, discrete number of the um, countable number of the exponential function, this set does not give you any orthogonal basis for L2 or D whatsoever you take A and D. So I'll get to that. So uh, by looking and observing this all, uh, uh, this result, so we ask ourselves what happens if we just kind of loosen the definition of the orthogonality and permit and say that ball permits any exponential basis with some level of orthogonality. So this question brought us actually to the following result that I'm going to mention in the third part of the presentation. But in order to be able to present the results, we need some preliminaries. So the, in, the, in the rest, BD will be the ball in the dimension two and higher. And the JD2 is the sub D2 is the Bessel function. And the Bessel functions have this beautiful property that the zeros are all disjoint and separated. So they are separated, for instance, we look at the red line, which is the Bessel function for D0. So we are not just really working with a D0, but I'm just an example. So these are the zeros. And for the, if the D is two, so will we have the green one, the green ones have the, so this fact that the zeros of the Bessel function can be written in a very explicit form as a d minus two over two, which is a fixed number, plus a half of the integer plus a small error, and they are separated. This is a very strong fact in a uh, strong fact that, that helps us to prove many results uh, for the ball. So uh, this one will denote characteristic function of the unit ball. And the characteristic function of the unit ball has a Fourier transform, and Fourier transform can be defined in a very usual way. But if we calculate, it's going to be shown in this way. When x is not zero, when x is zero, it's just the volume of the unit ball. So the orthogonality of the exponential and the unit ball, what does that mean? That means that if you take the exponential function, which are defined in this way, so each exponential function is associated, associated to an index C, which is a vector. And if you take two of these two exponential functions and take the inner product in L2 norm, in, in, in L2 uh, uh, space, and this inner product, if you write it down explicitly, it becomes Fourier transform of the characteristic function of the ball at difference of Pcn minus C prime. So these two exponentials are zero, I mean orthogonal, if and only if this guy here is the zero, the modulus of that, uh, that vector is the zero of the Bessel function. That comes right from here. So then this expression is zero means that the absolute value is the zero of the Bessel function. So what we are basically dealing, uh, we are dealing here, we're dealing with zeros of the Bessel functions uh, to understand the orthogonality of the exponential and the unit ball. So the unit ball does not have any orthogonal basis of exponential. So we already mentioned in historical part. So due to the use of Richard Peterson and the Fuglede. Therefore, what we are trying to do here, or what we plan to do here, we are planning to reduce the, the um, or loosen the definition of the orthogonality somehow in the following sense. So we take a function phi, which is a positive function, and define the positive real line. And it decays very fast at infinity to zero. So for a given domain with a finite measure, we define the exponential, the set EA, it defines all the exponential functions which are associated or indexed by an element A, vector A, and the capital A. So basically, they are defining the exponential function. So you have this collection of the exponential function, all right? So what do we say? We say this exponential, the set of exponential functions 
are approximately orthogonal, phi approximately orthogonal, if and only if the following happens. If the inner product of this ex each exponential functions from this set, from this set in here, the, the uh, inner product, the absolute value of the inner product can be bounded by the value of the phi at the difference of the a minus a prime. So notice that if these are zero, so phi is zero, all right? We can take not phi zero, it doesn't imply. I mean, we can take phi zero. That's what I mentioned in example here. Any orthogonal exponential basis in is phi approximately orthogonal basis if we choose phi equal to zero. So in other words, if I have for some sets, let's say for Q, for Q, we know that we have exponential basis, which is just orthogonal basis for L plus Q. So therefore, any orthogonal, exponential orthogonal basis is going to be automatically phi approximately orthogonal if phi is zero, if you choose phi to be zero, all right? But the other way around is not true. So therefore, what we are dealing with, dealing with something more general than orthogonal. And the next we are going to, since we know that there is no basis, so we are going to look in the definition of the basis and look at the general version of the basis, which are frame. And I am sure that there are many um, a mathematician here in the audience which are familiar with the frame. But before going to the definition, let me just mention definition of the frame, uh, a version of definition of the frame for the exponential function. So let's say that we have a set EA, exponential function. We're gonna say this is a frame for L to of omega. If the following happens, you can have two constants, C and capital C, such that for any f in L2 of omega, the sum over the modulus of the square modulus of the inner product of the f in any exponential A can be approximated from above and below by the norm of the f of the constant C and capital C. If this condition happens, then we say that the exponentials are framed for L2 of omega. So what is the good about the frames? The frames in general are redundant, which are very, uh, which makes them very uh, applicable tool in the applied mathematics. Anyway, another good thing about the frames is that like a basis, we can represent any function in terms of the basis in the, sum of, uh, in, the in the form of the uh, uh, spaces. Uh, but the difference would be that these coefficients won't be Anyway, this is a definition of the frame. Let's go back and see what we defined. We defined the following. Like before, we have an omega with finite and positive measure. And we have phi function phi, which decays to zero uh, at infinity. And we're going to say the set of the exponential is phi approximately orthogonal frame for L2 of omega if the set is a frame for L2 of omega. So this is the each of the sun. But what we have here, we have the approximate orthogonality. So what we are going to say, we are basically putting some measure between the angles. So between the, for the, for the uh, inner product of the two uh, exponential function. If this inner product of the two exponential functions can be approximate or bounded from above by phi at the point absolute value a minus a prime, then we say that these exponentials are a frame and Phi approximately orthogonal. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So I don't know how much I can say. Right. Okay. Uh, let me see the preliminaries. The the question that we have here is that is does the ball have any kind of frame which can be a phi approximately? For that reason, in order to answer uh, the question for the ball. So let's just uh, mention the stationary phase by Hertz. So this is going to be the following. It says that the stationary phase result, uh, saying that for the unit ball, the, the free transform, the free transform can be represented in the following way. You have the sine function here. You have this, the curvature of the ball, the curvature function. Well, I wrote the curvature. This is basically for the any convex set uh, with the smooth boundary. And then we have an error here. 
the error can be bounded by this is bounded by this uh, expression. Therefore, if we look at the if we combine this one star and double star, so we can get number two. What does number two say? Number two says that if you take any Pc and C prime and take the subtract Tx C minus C prime, so you're going to have C minus C prime. So if you take this right hand side of the two as a phi function, then any any um, collection of the exponential function is going to be the phi approximate orthogonality. So that doesn't really bring us in. So we need something strong. So what do we need really is the following. Let's say that if D is three, if D is three, so you are dealing with this polynomial, uh, sorry, this polynomial, somehow so this polynomial, or this is one, okay? And if, if phi is this polynomial, so we have, uh, we have the, Pi approximate orthogonality anyway. So what we need to know, we want to have is that some function phi which belongs in here. So the one that the wavy one. It could be zero at zero. It could be any number at zero. I don't care. But I want to have it way smaller than that. So if I have that, then I will want to put this this way. Let's say that phi decays much faster than the inverse of the polynomial uh, in here that I just. Uh, draw. This is the polynomial and this is my function phi. So the, if we have that phi, that L2 of the ball doesn't admit any frame which is phi approximately orthogonal. So let's compare this result to the result of the uh, Yosori catch Peterson in 99 and the Fugler 2001, which proved that the unit ball does not admit any orthogonal basis of the form E A. So what we are really saying here that is not just that, but also it doesn't admit any frame which could be in a phi approximately orthogonal if phi um, is um, kind of below that, that curve. So the proof um, is uh, technical. I'm just going to skip the proof uh, because I just, I guess so I don't have so much time. But I am going to, but I just want to mention something that how we get to, to that result. So we assume that there is a frame and everybody knows that when we have a frame, we have the positive density, upper positive density of the set A. So the set A is going to be upper density, positive density. So what we're going to do, the trick is that we are taking any element of the A and we thicken them. And this balls, little balls that you are seeing, they are the thickened version of the set A, which defines our frame. And we can also thicken them in a way that they do not meet because they are self-separated. And then this way we have a set E delta, which is going to have the upper Lebesgue density. When we set upper Lebesgue density we have, so we can do the following. We can basically show that for this upper Lebesgue density, a uh, positive upper Lebesgue density set that we have constructed by the assumption that we have prey, the result of the Furtenberg Kessner's own wise uh, fail. What does it say? It says that if you assume you have a set of the E with a positive Lebesgue density, so, so what happens is that you take, there is a threshold that if you take any L, Larger than the threshold, we can find two elements x and y with the distance up. So basically, this fails in this case, and that's the, because of the zeros of the Bessel function, because the zeros of the Bessel function are very well separated, and there is no way that we can get them close to each other. That's why we get to the contradiction. The next question, I, I'm sure that the, the first part of my talk so far, maybe the, it was familiar to some of you, but they are new results, I promise you. So the new result that we have here is that how big is that uh, set A? Let's say that we have an orthogonal uh, by approximate orthogonal set. So how big that could the set be? So let's compare the results to this here. So by use of which in 2003, we have the following. It's omega, it's symmetric convex body with smooth boundary and, and everywhere non-vanishing curvature, like, like ball. So if the exponential is an orthogonal set. We are not talking about the basis. We don't have basis here, but we can have orthogonal set. Then the two cases happen. Either A is going to be contained in a line. So 
So, which basically tells that it's not even, okay, it, it is, it's going to be either contained in a line or it's going to be fine. So they are two cases. So, but there is no estimation. I mean, there is no, no bounds uh, for the finiteness. So the only conjecture is that could be less than or equal to the D plus one. It's just a conjecture. So after reviewing this paper, we just realized that some of the techniques can be actually uh, improved uh, for this case, for the phi approximately. And we basically seen that we have the same result. So this is the first time that I'm, I am announcing this result here. I mean, forever. So we have the phi approximate uh, set where the exponentials, or the inner product of the exponentials are less than or equal, it can be approximated by phi. So if that happens, the set is either going to be finite or if it is infinite, that all the elements of the A will be inside a line. So basically this one is not just telling us how big is the set A? It also proves that the set A cannot give us a frame. Basically, this is the second proof for the previous theorem that I just mentioned. All right. Um, and there is another result here that I can mention maybe. So in previously, we were just talking about phi approximate ligand. Phi is point y less than or equal to the one plus t to the d plus one over two, something like that. When goes to infinity. So this is basically something pointless we were considering, but that could be something that we are asking too much from phi. So what we did, we consider a, that kind of uh, decay in average version, I mean, average way. So saying that in the average way, the integral of the 5p integral from 2j to the 2j plus one, is going to be less than or equal to this quantity. And that also, that we also could show that in this way also we can prove that there is no frame whatsoever for L2 of ball or anything, which is like a ball, which is a bounded symmetric convex set with a smooth boundary and no non-vanishing curvature. So the trick or the idea of the proof in this case was the following. So we did the following. We took, um, let's say this is the set A, where we are assuming there is a frame for it. And we, we just uh, fix one element A prime and we looked at the analogs, analog around that. And the analog has the inner, radius 2j and outer radius 2j plus one. By the assumption, inequality assumption in the previous line here, the, on the, uh, here, by this assumption, we prove that uh, we can say the sum over the, basically this average, the discrete average over the characteristic function and uh, over intersection of A with AJs. We are just going to look at the elements in AJs. So this average uh, uh, is less than or equal to this quantity. So what does it bring up? That, that basically helps us like a previous case, what if, but in very similar, with different, with non-similar non method. We could find a set E delta, another E of the positive density little bit positive density, for which this time uh, the Burgans is all uh, fail. How does that fail? So it fails the following way. Um, Burgans says the following. It says that if you have a, a set with upper limit density, so uh, this is basically the Burgan result is basically a pinned result of the uh, first finger Kat Nelson and Weiss, which is saying that if you have a set uh, E, did I say here? Yeah, the set E here uh, with the upper positive density, then for almost every, let's say this is a set A, then for almost set, for almost every element X0, so 
there exists a threshold such that if you take L larger than L0, then you will get an X such that the distance of X minus X0 is L. So it is going to be for almost X0. I'm not telling that for um, you can find two elements. So this is totally different from the previous case. So what we are doing here, we are going to extract some set E. So we basically called it the, sum, uh, the union of this A group for which not only for one of them, this space, but only and also for the some small neighborhood. So when you say some small neighborhood, the condition doesn't, doesn't hold. So basically that kills uh, the, the result by Brugan, which is for almost every X0 that exists, existence of the element. So this is uh, the idea of the proof, sorry for rushing. But I like also mention that this brought us to the following open problems that we would like to study. Let me start from the second one. The second one is about convex bodies with a point of curvature. So Yosemite Kess and Tao prove that let's say that if you have a cube and somebody bites it a little bit this far. So therefore you will have a point with, a, with, a, with some um, neighborhood which has a non-zero uh, curvature. So this set doesn't have any orthogonal exponential orthogonal basis. So the point is that you want to understand if with this, with modifying our result, this result, we can also say something, or maybe we need new technique to say that there is no phi approximate orthogonal exponential basis. So if there exists. So the other thing is that we are going to relate this result to the orthogonal uh, Gabor basis. So Gabor basis is a, it's a, it's a combination, it, it's, a, it's forming the following way. You take a window function G and you translate by countable many elements and you multiply by the uh, modu, uh, by uh, exponential function. And then if it uh, gives you an orthogonal basis for L2 of RD, then you have uh, Gabor basis, orthogonal Gabor basis. So in previous result, we proved that if you have a set like a ball, which is a smooth uh, and uh, all the other assumptions that I had here, then there is no way that the characteristic function of that set can give us Gabor basis. So we are basically, we are predicting that also we can say there is no way to have a phi approximate Gabor orthogonal basis for L2 of RD if the um, window function is the characteristic function of the ball. All right, uh, I guess my time is up and uh, they are the references here. And thank you so much for attention. Hey, thank you, Azita. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. <laughs> So I, I'm not an expert in this area. Uh, so I basically know nothing about this. I have a very naive question. Uh, is it easy to explain why the case D congruent to one modulo four is different? Yeah, that's a very nice question actually. So it's very also, also technical. Here's, a, here's a, uh, the idea. So when you say the sine function of this term is less than or equal to delta, so basically let's assume that this is zero. When it is zero, this part has to be the half of the integer, right? Right. Because two pi of the half of the integer makes sine zero. Because, but if it is very small, then what we can uh, say here is, what we can say is uh, a minus a prime is going to be the half of integer plus d minus half plus some error which depends on delta. Okay. So I hope you can right. visualize it that is with the graph of the sine function. All right. When the, uh, actually this must be, I guess. Mm. Uh, I guess this is, this must be error, it's not eight. All right, the, for the Gabor part, all right, we have the same thing, a minus a prime is d minus one half, uh, actually eight plus k half plus some error. So when d equals to 
4K plus 1, 4K prime plus 1, okay, let's say that it is 1 mod, mod 4, so what happens, D minus 1 over 8 becomes 4K prime uh -huh. over 8, mm -hmm. yes, K hat prime half, so this changes, right, right. but what we are really want to have, we want this stays a fixed plus a shift, of the, the half of the integer. So this is a very strong uh, basically technique for us to prove that the Gabor basis doesn't, I mean, some, get some contradiction um, by if, if the D is not equal to the one mod four. But when D equal to the one mod four or in general, they, it needs a little bit more other techniques that we are still, I mean, I announced that uh, we have some result, but it's not published yet. Okay, thank you. I think, I think, yeah, thank you. I think yeah. Ursula has a question. Yes, I have a small question. What happens if you have a phi approximate orthonormal basis and you change phi? Does the basis depend, I, I mean, get the basis smaller, bigger, depending on uh, the choice of phi? Or is it true that if it for one phi, it's not true then for all of the, the ones that decay different or similarly, it's also phi approximate. Uh, so the, the size, if A is uh, going to be uh, is small, well, if it is infinite, so it doesn't depend, doesn't matter. But it may uh, depend. I mean, your. I guess. I guess your, your your question is that if it depends if a is finite, it does not. The reason is that the finiteness coming from uh, the fact that let me see. So when we have this, yes. all right, this is going to be at a very large distances. This is going to be less than or equal to the one plus t or absolute value a minus a prime to the d plus one over half let's say epsilon, when, when they are very large from each other, I mean, far from each other. Yeah. So basically, this depends only on this. So the phi doesn't, doesn't really uh, affect That's them. what I yeah. was guessing. That's why, I was, that was my, my question exactly. Thank you. Very nice uh, question, thank you. Just a, I know that we're late, but just a quick question, Asita. Sure. Do you know sure. if there is any relation of the concept of approximate orthogonality and risk basis? So uh, that's what we are, uh, basically we said that here, when we have this approximate or the, uh, when there exists no frame. So that basically also includes the race basis. So I know what you're thinking because the idea actually we also started somehow we want to get closer to see that if there is any race basis for there. So, so if you we, we fix phi, there is no race basis which is phi approximately orthogonal. In other words, we don't have any frame, right? Which is phi approximately. But how further we can push this phi to say that if there is basis for that, I don't know that. This is an open question actually. <laughs> Thank <laughs> which you. Which takes our sleep from us. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm stopping the sh uh, share. Huh? Yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you, Azita, again for your nice talk. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. So let's have